it's either your truth or it's his. If it's gonna be yours, oh baby, you're gonna get a whole lot of likes. You're gonna get a whole lot of follows. You're gonna be the biggest, most iconic thing in the music industry, or you can live his truth. You know, you're, you're not gonna get a lot of likes. <laughs> Satan has the numbers, but he doesn't have the truth. Gay theology, gay Christianity, it's a feel good thing. And um, they were like, okay, well, we're gonna bring you in to do gospel. We're gonna bring you in to DJ. Later on that night or the next night, I was going to DJ and, and do like an R&B set, which wasn't so bad. But when I got into the presence of God, and so now you have all of the gay preachers are there, all of the lesbian preachers, and I know pretty much all of them, you know, they're familiar with me. I'm familiar with them and I love them. You know, I love them. I'm not better than them. But that night, the thing with me and when I was in this lesbian marriage, so that was really big for us. We both love God and we both went to church together. I had a a woman tell me, my testimony made her so mad and so angry, she started to shake. I mean, I left, and when I say left, left. I've never gone back, I've never slipped, I've never done nothing on the sly. There's never been any iota of ever going back. I'm truly changed. This is Montria, vocalist, producer, a woman of many hats, right? Formerly known as Miss Money. She was a part of the LGBT community in a former life and now she is leading a new life and we want to share her testimony the full scope of her story from the very beginning until this point and what she's going through even now living in the light of Christ so we're going to start this interview right now thank you so much for saying yes to the interview thank you for having me I'm so excited this is going to be crazy right <laughs> <laughs> all right all right yeah indeed right I'm excited I can't wait to hear um the fullness of your story right so so tell us like introduce yourself to the world tell them who you are well I am now known as Von Tria but for many many years I was an artist named uh Miss Money so I'm from Louisiana Monroe Louisiana I'm a country girl southern United States um and you know i've had this crazy ride through faith this crazy ride through the music industry and i mean i wear a lot of hats but i tell you what the testimony is probably the most interesting hat the heaviest hat the coolest hat you know it's so many things in one okay so we want to start from the beginning right so your testimony we want to get into that. So tell me how it started. How did you uh, become a part of the LGBT community? Well, okay, so I grew up doing music. Like, I've done music all my life. My entire life, I've done music since I was a child. And so I sang gospel behind my father as a kid. Um, and I was the type of kid, the preacher's kid, that really didn't like to go to church. You know, I grew up in a household where it was required. And so I had this relationship with God. I had this relationship with Christ. But it was not, it, I, won't, I don't want to say it was a contentious relationship, but it wasn't as authentic as he would have hoped it to be. Let's just put it that way. And so once I got deeper into music and once I got deeper into the music industry, I really started to meet people, you know, and I started, I sang gospel as a teenager and as a child. But once I got older and I got out of my mom and dad's house, I could sing other types of music. And so by the time, I mean, when I first started singing that type of music that was outside of holy music, I mean, it was just, it was almost like, it just happened so fast. You know, I, I'm at a show, I'm on stage, I meet somebody backstage, you know, and it starts out as someone who wants to be a friend, someone who really likes my gift, wants to be a friend. And that just morphed into meeting another woman who in the industry that, you know, was attracted to me. And before you knew it, I was just living it full blown. But it, a lot of it just came from being in the music industry and being in the music business and being around people What, you know, that was just a way of life for them. And I got caught up in it and it became a, a way of life for me. I've heard that people say that they're born that way, right? They're saying that right. um, I was watching a video recently where this guy was debating um, this okay. um, guy that said he came out of the community and he was telling the guy that there's no way that you could possibly uh, detach yourself from your reality. You're denying who you are. So right. how do you see that? Like, how did, uh, yeah, how did it start for you? I mean, it's like, it's. I can tell you like in a way that the world will understand, but the thing is, it's like God has a plan for us and Satan does too, right? So even though I was younger and in church, I mean, I feel like that was just something that I had a propensity for, you know, and, and that my flesh 
like that, you know, probably as early as I could remember. But because I was raised in a religious home, it wasn't anything that I really thought I would ever live as a lifestyle. Because I think a lot of us have tendencies towards the same sex, but some of us, you know, we're all little kids and I kissed a girl or two boys kiss or something when they're kids, but it doesn't really become a lifestyle that they embrace. And I think for me, you know, just like God had a plan for me, I believe Satan had a plan for me too. And I think that that was his plan for me. You know, just like God's plan for me is what I'm living now. I just, it just was for me. And I think for some people, even though it's hard to grasp, there's a, there's a war between good and evil in our lives. There's a battle for our souls. You know, so I could have I could have showed up at this show. I was probably 16 or 17 when I met the first girl that was like, you're going to be mine. You know, and I and when I went backstage and met this woman or girl at times, we were just she was a junior. I was I was a junior. She was a sophomore. You know, you're just thinking this is this girl I met. It's really cool. I like her. She likes me. She really likes me and we can be friends. And then it morphs into well, she really likes me and I really like her. So now we can kiss. And then it morphs into, you know, now this is something that I want to live like full blown. And then when I started out, I was a feminine woman. You know what I mean? I was a, I was a girl, you know, the longer I lived that lifestyle, it just became a whole nother, like I wanted to be a guy. So, you know, we all have different experiences. Some people don't get that far. Some people will never get to the point where they'll sleep with the same sex. Some people will get to the point where they'll sleep with the same sex, but they know that they're their natural gender. Then some people will get to the point where they're sleeping with the same sex, but then they don't know they, they natural gender and they don't have no gender. I mean, it was just getting out of hand. So when did you reach a place where the Lord touched you when you decided that or where did you begin your transition from this lifestyle to where you are now? I mean, I, everything was going great. Everything was going wonderful. I was on television. I had done a movie. I had a DJ residency. I mean, I had all like the cool things that people in the music industry have. I had all those things. And it was like probably 2004, 2004, 2005, when um, everything was going really well for me. And then I was diagnosed with muscular dystrophy. So I'm the type of person that when something like that happens, I'm not a, it's a coincidence person. You know, I'm, I'm pretty like, okay, something you're not going to be at the, you're not going to be enjoying something really, really awesome in your life. And that happened to me. That's just an automatic that God's trying to talk to you. That's just me, you know? And I, I feel like I've always had discernment of the spirit and I feel like I have, I've always had the gift of the Holy spirit. So but I wasn't ready to give up the life. I mean, who wants to give up the lifestyle, right? Who wants to give up the women? Who wants to give up being popular? Who wants to give up all the likes and all the follows? So I was like, mm, I'm just going to roll with this thing. I'm just going to roll it out. You know, the doctors are telling me there's something really wrong with your body. I'm just like, no, there's not. God's like, yes, it is. I'm trying to reach you. You know, and a lot of people don't believe that God uses affliction. He uses adversity. He uses, I mean, the worst thing that could possibly happen to you. He's going to use that for his good and his will. I go through like this, this part of denial that God's talking to me. I go through this whole thing where I'm just going to, I'm going to be me. I'm going to be me. God loves me as I am. I'm just going to do this thing. So I'm rolling through the industry. That's when the movie Pick Up the Mic comes out. So Pick Up the Mic comes out. And by this time, on, I'm on a cane. So we go to the Toronto International Film Festival. And Pick Up the Mic is basically a movie that chronicles about a dozen or so of the first wave of openly gay artists in hip hop. So this is 2007, 2008, 2009. The movie hits Toronto International Film Festival. It sells out. Bam, I'm on television. Okay, so now I'm dealing with this neuromuscular disease. I'm completely out of the will of God. But now all of these women have seen me on television. And so now I'm meeting tons of women. I never was a promiscuous woman, but I always had a woman, you know, period. I always had a girlfriend. We were always living together. And, you know, we just, I, was, I got into that. <laughs> 
And God was like, no, you don't understand, baby. You don't understand. Well, then I decided I want to be a man. And you can kind of see over time the pictures and how everything just kind of transitioned from me being a feminine woman to me wanting to be a man. And, you know, next thing you know, I'm, I'm in a wheelchair because I went from cane. I'm on a cane in the Toronto International Film Festival. So I'm traveling on a cane. Then I went to crutches. I was still touring when I was on crutches. And then um, I was in a wheelchair. And women love women. Women love people in wheelchairs. Like women are so <laughs> maternal, right? They're so like weird. It's like, oh my God, I know your guy. I love you. I want to marry you. I want to be with you for life. You know? So now here I am. I'm, I'm a woman who's, who's living as a boy, who's with a woman. And, and we have kids and we're doing the whole kind of pseudo lesbian thing. And I mean, God just one day was like, you have to understand this is, you know, the whole gay Christian thing. We were doing that. Oh, my God. And just one day he was like, it has to stop. And one day okay. it stopped. I mean, so just, were you married? I think you were married, right? I was married. But in the U.S., you could you could not legally get married at that time. So okay. we were married in the, you know, I was her husband. She was my wife. That sense. And so. Um, then I got involved in, well, so the thing with the gay community is it's really, a lot of it is about appearances, right? So I, I can no longer be this like sexy, cool, like masculine woman. Now I'm like a cripple, <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's, it, I, I really didn't fit in, even though I was gay, I didn't fit into that musical scene anymore. So that's when the gay church took me in. And so that's when I did the whole openly gay gospel singer thing, which is really, really, really easy. You can make a lot of money. You can go a lot of places being an openly gay gospel singer. So I did that for like five years, Okay. you know, and, and I mean, it was, you know, and, and I think that really was got to the point where God was like, now you kind of, now you own my territory. Now, you know, it's like before you were in the gay clubs and you were living this tremendous lie, but now you're trying to drag me into it, right? And so that's when like everything went wrong. I mean, and he was trying to get my attention more because I was going to get sex reassignment surgery. You know, I was yeah. going to go ahead and transition to male. I was ready to do that. And um, I think for me, you know, God uses emotion so I was always down. You know, if you go and look at my old pictures, it was very rare that I smiled. You know, that you could see a sadness in my face. Mm. And those are all online. You know, I'm sure we'll get to that later. But you could you could just see, like, this really, like, torn person. And it was, um, you know, it just seemed like here I am in a wheelchair trying to navigate the world. And I don't even have my Jesus to help me. You know what I mean? Mm. He was there, but I wasn't. I wasn't accepting, he was accepting me for me, but I wasn't accepting him for him. You know, I wasn't accepting him for his truth, right? So that's the part that gets scary people right there is his truth. Well, it's it's either your truth or it's his. If it's gonna be yours, oh baby, you're gonna get a whole lot of likes. You're gonna get a whole lot of follows. You're gonna be the biggest, most iconic thing in the music industry, or you can live his truth. You know, you're, you're not going to get a lot of likes. <laughs> you know, our biggest stars in gospel are nowhere near close to a Taylor Swift, to a Beyonce. I mean, we got some big stars, but we don't have anybody doing, even our Christian rappers aren't doing Eminem numbers. They're not doing the numbers of the world. Because when you bring his truth in, people are going to hate you. And so now I'm going through the hermit, you know, I'm going through the hermit phase. I'm going through the I've already been on BT Sunday Best and oh my gosh, is she going to do the gay gospel singer thing? And I came out and I was like, no, I'm not going to do it. You know, and so then I got out and toured, you know, with the testimony because I was touring as an openly gay gospel singer. Now I'm out touring with the testimony and saying I'm being delivered. It's completely different. You know, now I'm just kind of like, you know, I'm here. It's me and Jesus. And I don't really know if I have a fan base anymore. And I, you know, I, if I go places, I don't know if anybody's going to show up anymore. It, it's nothing like it was when I was in the gay club and I wanted to be a boy. It's not like mm -hmm. that anymore. And I'm just, you know, I'm just taking everything one day at a time now. You know, my, my parents are both deceased, you know, and I'm still living with this neuromuscular disease and it's just me and Jesus now. So I've, 
I mean, I've gone the entire spectrum from me in the world, no scripture, no word. I'm not talking about the Bible where we throw the verses away that we don't like, or we come up with the white man created the Bible and all this, you know, you just accept the word as it is. And so now I'm on that end of the spectrum. I'm not perfect, but I'm not who I was either. You know, was there a moment or was it a, a set of progression that brought you to the realization that this is not what God wants? Well, okay. So basically what I was doing is with the gay churches, I started on one side of the United States. So I started in Long Beach, California, and I did gay churches across the nation. And I ended up in North, North Carolina and um, they paid me a lot of money. I was there for like quite a few days living in a, you know, seeing the city. And um, they were like, okay, well, we're going to bring you in to do gospel. We're going to bring you in to DJ later on that night or the next night I was going to DJ and, and do like an R&B set, which wasn't so bad. But when I got into the presence of God, and so now you have all of the gay preachers are there, all of the lesbian preachers, and I know pretty much all of them, you know, they're familiar with me. I'm familiar with them and I love them. You know, I love them. I'm not better than them. But that night I remember singing and all these gay people, you know, all of these people who have been, excuse me here, um, deceived, you know, um, I was a part of that. You know, I was a part of this movement to deceive these people. And even though it was a lot of money and even though it was so easy, I could not do it anymore. Like it was a weight on me. You know, I had lived this lifestyle like 22 years and I had seen everything. I had been with women. I mean, you know, been with men who wanted me to be their man. I mean, I had thought about re sex reassignment surgery and now I'm out telling people, opening my Bible, singing gospel songs, you know, and I'm inviting people into this lie. Just like God was like, you can't, that's why I draw the line. You know, and it was like, dude, you've been a lot of things, but you're not going to be a sodomite anymore. And I know that word is kind of biting, but that was, that's what I was. I was a sodomite. You know, I lived that culture. I lived that life. You could be a woman being a man, a man being a woman, you could, and then you could bring that into the presence of God and convince people that that was okay. You know, I was so far out of it there, never mind the drugs and the alcohol and the pornography and everything else that I, that I experienced by being involved in that culture. We don't never want to talk about that stuff. You know, we not to that point yet, but I mean, we have to go back to like the root of it. For me, the root of it was hands down homosexuality. That was it. And then, you know, after the Lord was like, hey, this gay Christian thing and this gay gospel singer thing, that's got to go. I mean, I just let it go. It was hard. I mean, I went through like this whole like, is she a man? Is she a woman thing? And I'd sing gospel and I'd have these crazy men's suits on, but I'd have like wigs on because I had to go through that whole period of learning how to live like a woman again because I hadn't lived like one in so long. Like, that's crazy, right? And I know there are people that are watching this that you've accepted that for your life. And this is my thing. What I love about God is he ain't forcing nobody to do nothing. If you want to be a transsexual, you know what? Be the best transsexual you can be. You want to be a lesbian? Be the best one you can be. Because I was, I was the best homosexual that wanted to be a transsexual. I could be for 22 years, no problem. And I was the last person to tell you that I was going to change. But God, everything that he put in place, like he orders your step. The Bible says he orders your step. Oh, he was ordering mine. And every time I got away from him, something would happen. Something would happen. Something would happen until finally, you know, it's, it's me and him now. What was the response like when you decided to step away from all that, the gospel side of it? Like, what was it like? Your friends and stuff? Like, what was that response? Well, yeah. Like, what was that like? Nobody believed me. No one believed me. They're like, oh, you're having a bad day. You know, you and your wife are fighting. And so, you know, I, I told some of the gay preachers that I wanted to get out. And they were all like, you know, you're going through a phase. And my friends were like, the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to lose your fan base. Because I had a lot of people that supported me. I mean, straight up to the top of the industry that were cheering for me. And then... Now you're telling me I'm going to lose that. And everybody was like, man, nobody listens to gospel. <laughs> you know, it's not going to work. And I mean, they were partially right. I mean, I did lose my fan base, you know, and, and 
it was hurtful. And that's so hard. And I get it. You know, when you've done something for so long and you want to follow Christ, you're afraid of the things that you're going to lose. You're afraid of losing things. You're afraid of losing your, your, your status. I mean, we're in a world now where in America, you're afraid of losing your job. You're afraid of losing. I was afraid of losing my music career. But that's required for many of us, really for all of us, we're required to let go of the things. I'm not talking about get out here and be homeless and all this other crazy cultish stuff. I'm talking about living his truth, which living his truth means denying our flesh. And that's the hard part. And so my friends were like, we can't relate to that no more. We can't relate to you singing gospel songs. We can't relate to that. So, I mean, the church was behind me for a little while, but now the church is like, hey, we kind of rolling with the world now. You know, the church is like, we don't want to upset the gay people. So we're going to let them come in here and get married. So, I mean, towards the end of my gospel tour, I toured for eight years. So the first three years I toured as an openly gay singer. The last five years were the testimony. The first two of those five years were great. So that's going to be 2013, 2014, because I did BT Sunday Best 2013. 14, 2015, the testimony went viral. Oh my gosh. And then it was just like, after that, you know, people really took me for, they were for real. They, they knew I was serious then. And I mean, I, I'm not going to say I lost all my friends, but yeah, most of them. I mean, I'm not going to lie and say I have all of my friends because I don't, but I have a few that were like, hey, this is what you want to do. As long as you're not tripping on us. I'm like, hey, I love y'all, you know, transsexual friends. I got lesbian friends. I love them, but that's not me. And so my thing with the gay community is this. Y'all want us to accept y'all for who you is. I need y'all to accept me for who I am. You know, I love the gay community. I love them, but I'm not doing that anymore. Don't have nothing against what y'all doing because it's really not me the gay community has a problem with. You have a problem with that word, and that 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 hope and the, the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, God, roll up into one. You got a problem with all three of them. That, not me. I have nothing to do with it. I'm just an easy target. That's it. I'm an easy target. Have at it. But you're not going to separate me from God anymore. That go, that's not you as in the person. Satan, God has his angels. Satan got his demons. Nobody separating me from God anymore. And whatever people want to write about me and say about me and put in the comments on here. I mean, my YouTube got so bad, you can't even leave comments no more. And I just turned them off, you know, but hey, it goes both ways. I got to love, I got to love them. And I would appreciate that the gay community loves me, but there is no love when it comes to God and Satan. I mean, Satan hates God. He hates that word. And hence, if you're somebody that wants to dwell on that word, hey, you don't get hate. And that's just it. Yeah. As you said, it's like, they loved you for you, Montreal, right? But the moment God came into the picture, it's like, that's when the opposition began. So he's the one that people have a problem with, right? So that's the thing. Once we're with the world, we're fine. The moment we leave the world is a problem because now you're something else. You know, we're not of the yeah. world anymore, right? So it's, it's like, it's a, we're supposed to be like, like, I'm not a religious person. You know, I, I just have this relationship with Christ that makes me different than a lot of people, but I'm not, religious in any way, you know, I, and I think religion, it, it, it has divided people. And that's one thing about Christ. Christ was always, he walked with so many different people and he healed so many different people. And he, regardless of who they were, adulterers, and God uses a prostitute in the Bible. I mean, the apostle Paul was a murderer. These are the people that God loves. So the homosexual community he loves them. You know, he loved me. His grace is with them. And it's so it's so amazing at his grace and his mercy. But then there's a time where he's also our father. And just like my father used to chastise me when I used to do things around the house that were not right, because my father was a tremendous father. God does the same thing with all of us. Right. And I think that's what people need to understand. Whoever you are, when you come to Christ, you have to deny yourself. It doesn't matter who you are. When the Lord calls you, he requires a denying of yourself, a dying right. to yourself. I formed right. you in your mother's womb. And I think right. there's this opposition. We're fighting. We're mm -hmm. always, just like we fight with our parents, that rebellious stage is the same thing. <laughs> We're fighting with God. No, nah, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. But he knows what's best. And that's the hardest part about it. It's the flesh. 
you know, the flesh and the, and the world celebrates the, the flesh and it looks so, it's like one big party, you know, and you're just like, it's a great time. And that's how sin works. It's so attractive. But one thing that I have that I didn't have then is I have peace. Like I'm so much happier now that I'm living with Christ and I'm fearless. I mean, you're, it is a pruning process. You're right. It is a pruning process and it hurts, you know, when you're embarrassed sometimes I've been embarrassed sometimes and you're humiliated sometimes, but I still hold my head up high, you know, and when I speak, I speak from a place of confidence and nobody can take me out. Like I see so much of the world, like the world, they face problems. They'd be ready to kill themselves and kill folks and all this other kind of stuff. I'm at peace. This whole pandemic, I've been at mm. peace. God's provision has taken over my life. I mean, I lost my mother a couple of weeks ago, but I'm happy. You know, I'm, 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 I've worked through it because she's in a much better place mm. and I'm not alone. You know, so many people in the gay community, they were alone and they find love, right? They find love. When we really dissect that, though, so much of that is lust, you know, because there's the sexual component to homosexuality and, and, and men wanting to be with men and women wanting to be with women for the sexual desire part. But we know that in our society, particularly in American culture, I don't know about a Japanese culture, sex has become like a friend to people here. And, you know, once you replace that friend with another one, it's not even sex, not even important no more. Pornography, you know, identifying as a gender that you're not and being pressured to do so by society. That's not even important no more, even though, you know, you're going to take your lashings and you got to be wise. You know, you want to put on the whole armor of God. Sometimes I go out, I just got my kneecaps on. I ain't even got the whole armor on, you know, but he's teaching me you have to have the whole armor. In yeah. order to do this, and it's hard. We're not perfect people, but we're very different than the world. What would you say to those people who are saying you're lying, you're deceiving yourself, all these things? What would you say to those people? I'm not here to convince you of anything. I'm not, I'm not here to convince anybody of anything. I know what God did for me, and I'm here to tell my story. And just like everybody else is telling theirs, I'm telling mine. Because you can't convince anybody who doesn't want to be convinced. You know, and that's I think part of the issue with some of us in the church is that we try and so hard, we try and so hard. I'm just telling my story. And I know that there's power behind the story because if there wasn't power behind the story, people wouldn't attack me. <laughs> there's gotta be something. In there. And what that power is, it's that that spirit hitting that flesh. That's all it is. It's, that's, it's not my spirit, good grief, who am I? You know, that's the spirit of God hitting that flesh. And that's all, and when that flesh hits it, all you gotta do is lash out. When you turn on light in darkness, the roaches scatter. You know, when the voice of Christ comes into a room, the demons tremble. And that's, that's the power of this testimony. We got a lot of testimonies out here. We got the ex-alcoholic, ex-crackhead, ex-prostitute. But there's one testimony right now that causes people to just, I had a, a woman tell me, my testimony made her so mad and so angry, she started to shake. I thought to myself, no, baby, that ain't, that ain't anger. That's some demons trying to come up out of you. I, I was being comical, but it's true. That's the only testimony on this planet right now that causes people to get in such a rage. But that's because God is speaking to a right now generation. It's, this is the right now testimony. And when that testimony goes forth, I don't even spend a lot of time on YouTube no more because I don't have to. I already know the spirit's just going to take this thing and start hitting people with it. Some people are going are gonna to reject it. But some people are going to listen to this testimony and they're going to say, man, even though I'm not ready to accept it, there's something about what she's saying. It's, it, it's hitting me. It's touching me. And that's OK, because it's a process. God's work in all of us is a process. So I didn't I didn't just accept Christ back into my life and stop cross dressing and stop. You know, it took it was like a five, six year process for me to go through the whole thing. But now that I've gotten through the process. I feel better about my life. I love my life. I love the work that I do for the for the body of Christ. And I'm so strong, even though I'm physically, you know, physically, I have these challenges. But my mind and my heart, my spirit, man, whoo, they're so strong right now. And uh, that's all I could I could tell somebody that doesn't believe. I'm not here to make you believe. And it's not me you disagree with. I'm just here to tell my story. That's it. Your foundation from your mother and father right, growing up, you think that helped you along your journey? Yeah, because 
I told my mother when I was like, first became a homosexual, I told my mother I was gay and that was it. I was never going to change. And she told me, she didn't yell at me. She, I was probably about 19 then. She didn't yell at me. She didn't go off on me. She just said, never say never. You know, and, and she prayed for me and prayed for me and prayed for me for 20 years. And one day I got delivered and she was like, wow, you know, it took 20 years of praying, but that foundation and to know that when things were, were tough, I didn't have to put a gun to my head. You know, I didn't have to get out here and attack people. Even though I'm attacked, I don't have to get out here and attack people. I can still carry myself with dignity, integrity. I can still smile when people wish bad on me. You know, these are all principles of the, in the foundation of the Bible that my parents, you know, gave me. And so I'm, I'm cool now. I can face an entire world. National television, no problem. Maximum security prisons. I've been everywhere as a testimony. It's no problem. It's no problem. How did you, when you were growing up, you said 16 at age 16, right? You met that first person. Was there a, a time where you struggled with what your father taught you versus what you wanted to do? Like, what was that period like? Was there a period like that? Yeah, there was. And then it was like a tug of war. You know, it was God saying one thing, but then you're in the music industry and it's saying another thing, you know, and it's just like you're saying, if I go this way, it's hard. You know, it was going to be hard. And I like, you know, who doesn't want somebody to love you? You know, and, and women loved me, you know, and who doesn't want to have a gift that people don't love? And I'd go places and the gay club, they loved me. And, and the gay community, that's one thing they do is they support their own. So the gay community can take you from rags to riches in no time. We see it now. You know, we see even in hip hop, we're seeing more rappers who are taking on the feminine qualities and, and they're embraced by an entire segment of the, of the culture and they're selling millions of records. And so how do you convince somebody to let that go to follow God? There has to be a conviction. There has to be a deep conviction that is brought on by the Holy Spirit, right? And so we, the Bible talks about the gift of the Holy Spirit. We all have access to that gift, but we all don't take advantage. And that's too bad because the Holy, the Holy Ghost is, it's incredible, right? Jesus Christ in his grace, in the miracle of the cross that allows us to communicate one-on-one -on -one to God with the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's incredible. And I used to go to gay, gay clubs. And I mean, I just started playing gospel music in the middle of the gay, uh, gay clubs, you know, and it was like Kirk Franklin and it had to be. But that was because that Holy Spirit was beginning to permeate my life, you know, and it, it, it was starting to carry over to the gay club and in the gay churches where I used to go. And I'd sit on that back row when I get done singing, you know, the Holy Spirit would tell, would whisper in my ear, you, you're wrong. You know, you're wrong. You know, you can't do this. And, and just over time, it's it's a process. God's so gentle. He's so merciful. He's so loving. You know, all those nights out on tour. And, and, the, and the women used to leave me their phone numbers. And when I was singing gospel after church service was over, they'd give me their numbers and they'd meet me at the hotel room. Now, I never engaged in nothing. I had to throw some people, you know, out in the dark. I, but it was wrong. You know, it was wrong to, to have lesbians following me around on, on when I was singing for the gay churches. Not, not to pray, but to lay. You know, that wasn't right. Mm -hmm. I had just gone too far. And it had caught up to me and, you know, everyone living that lifestyle, whether you, whether you believe in the word or not, God reckons with all of us. And my time of reckoning came in this lifetime. So I'm so fortunate about that. You know, and even though I have physical challenges and I, I'm still in a wheelchair, I've been in a wheelchair for like 15 years. I was, I lived a homosexual lifestyle for 22 years. And so I've been in a wheelchair like 16, 17 years now. And even with that, I'm okay. You know, I'm, all, I'm, I'm so okay. I'd rather be this than what I was and be on national television and have a lot of fans and have all those deals and opportunities. I'll take this any day because at least I'm, I'm living an authentic walk, transparent walk with Christ. And he knows my heart and he knows, hey, you know, she doesn't look all that and she doesn't have the glitz and the glamour anymore. But at least she's trying. And I think he'll he'll accept that before he accepts unbelief. 
what would you say to the, the church, um, the gay church, right? What would you say to them? Because I think that might be the hardest segment of society to accept this reality. How would you minister to those people? Like, what would you say to them? I mean, Tony, Tony, Tony used to have a song say, it feels good. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a feel good Gay theology, gay Christianity, it's a feel good thing. And not only gay Christianity, but we have other se- prosperity gospel. We have other segments of Christianity that's out of point too. But the thing with me and when I was in this lesbian marriage, so that was really big for us. We both love God and we both went to church together. We both worship together. And so the way that we justified it was, well, hey, we're together, but we love you, God. You know, we're passionate about you. And the thing is, the Bible, either you believe the word or you don't. Again, it doesn't, it's not me, it's the word. So either you're going to take it as, you know, inerrant, Holy Ghost inspired, and this is your pathway for life, or you're going to reject certain portions of it, which is what I was doing when I was in gay Christianity, and you're going to try to chisel the world like it's a sculpture so that that sculpture reflects your life. And my thing is this, hey, you want to be a gay preacher? I was out there with all the gay preachers, and trust me, they got big numbers in the gay church. Feel free, but don't think that you're getting away with anything, because that's one thing that the word talks about will not be tolerated in the kingdom is the Lord not going to have no deceivers. He's not going to have people out here leading people. You know full well what the word says, but to take a position of leadership in that church and to push that lie, that's one thing. To be just a lost sheep is another. And we do have gay Christians that are just lost sheep. We, We got people in the regular church lost, go to church every Sunday, and the preacher just up there talking just crazy stuff the prosperity gospel and all of this other naming and claiming and all of the stuff that's not in the word. We have a lot of people that are taking it, but at the end of the day, the answers are in the word. Do you want to accept that? I mean, I decided I wanted to accept it, you know, and I I think I'm in a minority though. What do they say to people when it comes on to like the part of the Bible that talks, speaks against it? What's the justification? They just skip it over? So basically, with the gay church, you're gonna, there, so there's a couple of there's a couple of reasons why the gay church believes God's okay with homosexuality. So you're gonna get the God accepts you for who you are argument. You're gonna get the I was born this way argument. You're gonna get the God loves us all. You're gonna get the whole entire translation of the Bible is wrong. So you're gonna get that, and then you just have avoidance. We just avoid that scripture. Um, the Bible, people have manipulated the Bible so that it discriminates against gay people. You get all of this crazy stuff, except for the truth. You get everything but the truth. And that's what I always say is that Satan has the numbers, but he doesn't have the truth. And so you go to any gay church in America, any, I mean, we have gay denominations. Um, you know, we have transsexual preachers and pastors now. The churches are packed. Because that's where our society is. Our society wants to hear what fits them. And so in the gay community, you hear affirming. We have affirming churches. Like, you ain't supposed to be going to church to affirm you. We're supposed to be going to church to affirm the power of Christ. We've turned the whole entity of the church for our benefit and for our agendas and for our opinion. We have tried to put Christ out of the church. That's why the Bible says he coming back to get the church. And instead of us putting him out, he putting some of us out because he's coming back for a church without spot or blemish. This is what the word said. He's coming out back. for a church. And so, hey, what feels good, people going to do. And I'm sure there are things that you struggle with. And imagine that. Imagine if you went to a church and you struggle with stuff and they got up in there and told you it's OK or didn't talk about it at all. You're not, you're not getting anything from it. You're just getting an experience. We're talking about just a, a, a worship. You know, now you get the quote unquote worship experience. Now, Christ is not into a worship experience. He's into a life altering, soul changing experience for your eternal existence. That's far above a worship experience. And so until people can get that, you're just going to get a whole bunch of lies, I guess. 
have you had an experience that grounded you like in your faith like or is it what your parents taught you and your experiences with god that grounded you in your faith like what do you think grounds you when you have all the detractors coming at you well i think one of the things that has changed since i've been delivered is i'm more loving and so i just love people you know i love the people that can't stand me i love the people that hate god i have a very good friend who hates Christ. I mean, she hates Jesus Christ. She hates Christians. And we've become really good friends. And I asked her, I'm like, you hate Christians. So why do you, why do you and I get along so well? I talked to her as a matter of fact, yesterday. And she said, because you're different. You know, and I think that for me, I know where I came from. And I understand God's grace and mercy on me. So when people are like that to me, I just let them make it, man. I just let them make it. I don't, I don't respond on social media anymore. You know, I'm, I'm, I don't like the tumultuousness. And, and sometimes people go after the people that support me. I don't have that many that do. And that was really making me uncomfortable on YouTube to see people that supported me being attacked. But I just love them back, you know, and I don't fool with them. Sometimes you got to be smart. You got to choose and pick your battles. And you have to understand that Christ is ultimately the one that's going to fight for you. He's the one that's going, he's the one that died on the cross. So these amazing things can happen for you when you're down and God's always got his eye on you. So I don't never have to worry. And I don't worry anymore. I mean, it was hard at first because the testimony went viral in 2015 and for 72 hours, I was everybody's bestest Christian friend. And I was everybody worstest bigot friend, you know, in 72 hours. Shoot, I got through that. I feel like I can get through anything now, you know, and and it, and it is what it is. And I just, I, I encourage people to just love folks, mm -hmm. you know, when they, when, when they reject the gospel, love them and let them go. Because you never know, they might come back around to you later on in life. They might come into a situation that, hey, you know, I remember you talked about Jesus and I working in the industry now, I work behind the scenes. I don't perform much anymore, but I work behind the scenes. And, you know, I write and I arrange for R&B producers and hip hop producers. And one night, you know, this R&B producer out of the blue just sends me this long email. You know, he had Googled me because, of course, when you're contracted to work for people in the industry, you go Google them. That's the first thing you do. And we had been talking for weeks and weeks and weeks. And he sends me this long email and he's like, Hey, I know we're supposed to be working on this music project, but I read your testimony and, you know, my daughter's a transsexual. She wants to, she's like 11 years old and she wants to transition to male at 11. And he's like, you know, what advice would you give to me? And I don't believe in God and we don't really, we don't read the Bible, but we're working together, you know, and I, man, I just hit that man with love. I didn't give him no scriptures. I didn't give him no sermon. I was like, you know, you got to love her. You have to love her. If she wants to be a boy, you know, it's your house. You have to, you have to, and everybody's household is different. You know, some people, they let their children do that. So I just, you know, I just hit them with love, man. Just, you know, and now this is somebody that would never have seen me on television singing gospel. They would have never have seen me at church singing gospel. It was just somebody in the R&B music industry that I worked with. And he and I will probably work again, we, I hope. And there's no bad blood because I just gave him love. And that's how you got to hit folks with this. You got you to gotta feed it to them like a baby. Just like Satan is feeding stuff to people. It's like candy to them. You know, we don't make it feel good to the point that it's a lie. But you, 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 you know, hey, I love you. You know, man, we, you know, your daughter wants to be a man. Oh, man, you know, you, I, you know, just, just love your daughter. You know, you, you, you want to be a, you, you, you're in a relationship with a lesbian or something. You want to get out. Pray to God. You know, pray to God. If you're a lesbian that wants to be out of a lesbian marriage, just pray to God. And let God do the work. And, and if you're a man who's, who's transitioned to a woman and you want to come back, just, just understand, trust God to do the work. That's, we don't have that trust factor. That's hard, the fear. You got to trust him through all that. In your relationship, how did you, like when you wanted to leave, right? How did your wife take that? What was that like? Well, <laughs> it didn't go over really well, that's for sure. I mean, so... Um, the relationship had gotten, you know, it got kind of hairy towards the end because when God's trying to bring you out, it's like, uh, uh, it's, everything just starts to go. Everything just becomes really just explosive kind of. And so she didn't take it well, but she says, I don't talk to her anymore. I haven't talked to her in years. 
But well, I had to change my number and, you know, just you just kind of disconnect. But she says that she could tell something was happening to me. You know, she could tell that something was changing me. And I just left. Whatever I had over there, whatever was involved, it was a car involved. I mean, I had bought her a car and all this other kind of stuff. You know, whatever is whatever. I just left. And that was it. I just left. And I wasn't worried about what people thought. I mean, I kind of was, but I mean, I left. And when I say left, left. I've never gone back. I've never slipped. I've never done nothing on the sly. There's never been any iota of ever going back. I'm truly changed and will never go back. Well, people will say, well, then you never were in the first place. Baby, you need to go and check my track record. It's out there for the public forum to see. Television shows, movies, pictures, the whole thing's documented. From beginning to end, how I got started and how it ended. You can see the whole thing in, in living color. It's a beautiful thing the way that God has set up my testimony. I feel so blessed, even though it's hard. I feel so fortunate. If this world was so awesome, why do the people who have the most seem so miserable? I mean, why is it? It's never enough. It's, you know, one Grammy is not enough. You got to have two. A plat one platinum record is not enough. You've got to have three. And then why do we have people that attain all of this stuff and then they just die. I mean, Whitney Houston, Michael Jackson, you know, and what is it about this world? It's like fame is a drug. It's such a powerful drug. And so social media is, social media is brilliant because it has now tapped into everyone's sense of wanting to be famous, everyone. And so everyone's drawn to this thing and it's just a drug. But if you could have, a, a sense of fulfillment without always feeling to have to prove something. See, that's how I feel about my whole entire testimony. I'm not here to prove nothing. Now that I have Christ in me, it's not easy, but the burden is not nearly as heavy as it was at the beginning when I was trying to do this on my own. So I was like, well, I got to go out and tell the testimony. He's like, no, well, yeah, you do. But really it's, it's me working through you. And so I think when we talk about reaching Christians and reaching people who don't believe, we defer back to him and we let him do the work and we're just a friend. We're a smiling face. We don't want to be judgmental, but you know, you got to be truthful too. Let's not get, you know, we don't want to use not telling the truth and become cowards. We want to still be confident and still be strong, but you got to do it in a loving way. And so really what happened with me is I found a church after I did BT Sunday best, which was, Oh, gosh. I mean, it was a great experience, but definitely not one of the highlights of my professional career. Um, you know, I came home and I was just like, you know, what do I do? I, people think I'm gay and I really want to get out. And I found this church. It was a small church. I was going to a large church before, but now I was going to a church with just a few dozen people. And these people were so kind and so loving. And I used to go to church dressed up like a boy and I'd wear my men's suits, you know, and the bishop thought I was a man for a little while. And, you know, after a while, I just, I really loved these people and I was interested in what they had to say. And I was interested in their perspective of the Bible because they loved me for who I was. You know, it didn't matter that I was, you know, wearing a fade and wearing one earring and, you know, and I'd go to church with like jerseys on and like have my boxes hanging out and stuff. You know, it was obvious what I was dealing with. These people were just so kind. They never told me to go home and change my clothes. You know, they they never told me that I that I looked like a boy and I couldn't be a part of the worship service. They really embraced me. And after a while, I was interested. And I, I felt like, wow, you know, if this is Christ, I'm cool with that. Because I was always like a lot of gay people. All Christians hate gay people. That's a lie. It's not true. There's, a, there's so many Christians out here that are just cool. You know, and they and they acknowledge that they're imperfect. You know, it's just, hey, I just believe differently than you, but we, we can still fellowship. You still, we can still be friends. So, you know, I think that people have to really see the love of Christ every day in everyday practical terms, because everybody's not going to go to church, right? So you might be that one guy that somebody sees and talks to, or the one guy on YouTube that somebody sees and like, okay, he loves the Lord, but he cool, you know? One question I want to ask, because it just jumped into my head and I feel like people are going to ask, they're going to ask, do you still struggle with the feelings and stuff like that? 
no, 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 uh-uh. no. Yeah. And so now I like guys, you know, I, and if you watch this video that I have, can God change a homosexual? There's a segment in there where you have two former lesbians and you have one who's not ready and me who's totally ready. Right. So, I mean, that the same sex attraction, the possibility of going back. No, I don't struggle at all. But I understand that there are people that do. There are people that will follow Christ and for the rest of their lives, they'll struggle. You know, praise God, I don't have that struggle with that particular thing. I'm over it. It's wonderful. I love it. You know, and I can't wait to meet the perfect guy. You know, I meet guys all the time, but I can't wait to meet the I can't wait to meet the perfect one. You know, and then and then that will be the next level of the testimony. And then people will probably have new reasons to to discount it. But it's not me that you're trying to discount. You're trying to discount someone who cannot be discounted. I've seen God work not only in my life, in other people's lives. I mean, he's just done things so tremendous, but it will take you wanting to trust. Right. We, we just pray that people will trust to experience him on a whole new level. What about the people that say that even if they accepted Christ, they aren't attracted to the opposite sex? Like, what would you say to those people? Only time will tell, you know, I mean, I was the same way. I'm never going to do my nails. I'm never going to wear women's clothes. I'm never going to like guys. Now it's the complete opposite. I mean, I put on my makeup every day. I I met a guy yesterday in the bank. And he and I talked and it was, you know, it was like a a guy attracted to a woman and a woman attracted to a guy. And it was so natural for me. And it was so, I wasn't like, oh my God, he likes me. I'm like, no, I love he like me. I know I'm fly. You know, he's fly. And we just, it was just so natural, you know, and it's, it's, you know, we have to remember that God is a God of natural, right? And even though we live in a world where Satan makes unnatural things appear to be natural. We know what's natural and what's not natural. We know two women cannot have children. We know two men cannot have children. We know that the anatomy that God created, his design, it's so perfect. We know imperfection in his design when we see it. There's some transsexuals out here, they're pretty convincing. But we know when it's all said and done, it's not natural. It's not God's design, Mm -hmm. right? And so when you operate in the natural, ooh, that's when miracles can happen. When you operate in the spirit, that's when I make, I'm not talking about a whole lot of money. That's not, because that's what the world is, money, material things. I'm talking about horrible things can happen and the miracle of Christ can just come into your life and do something. I mean, how can you not be in awe of God's design and how male bees pollinate flowers and how you need different genders and species to work together for things to work in harmony. How can you not be in awe? It's so incredible. It brings tears to your eyes. Woo! But I, you know, I think about some of the things that I did and some of the wrong that I did. And I'm so sorry, you know, and I'm so emotional about the deceit and about being a part of what I did with the gay church and about Letting people believe this instead of just being like, hey, you know what? I was wrong. I could have come at that that way. Uh, you know, I, I, I was wrong. I could have sang gospel as an openly gay gospel woman and at least got up there and said, you know what, you guys? I need y'all to pray for me. I never did that not one time. Never did it not one time. And I got so many standing ovations when I was out singing as an openly gay gospel singer. But now I'm so sorry for those things that I did. And I hope that that God has found it in his will to forgive me and to give me his grace. And I still pray for forgiveness and I pray for guidance, but it's so amazing that he's merciful and he's given me another chance. And, and when I read about people who die in bondage, alcoholics, homosexuals, liars, people who die in their sin, I always think, man, that could have been me. That could have been me that didn't get a chance to get it right. I'm so blessed that I got a chance to get it right. And because he gave me a chance, I know he'll give somebody else a chance. So I'm not going to dog nobody when they're in it. I'm going to love them. And I'm going to be friends with them and smile at them and have trust in my heart that he's going to work it out for the people he wants to work it out for. 
So guys, there you have it. This was Montreal. I know that there might be many questions that you guys have, right? I might not have asked all the questions that you guys have, but if you have questions, you can reach out to Montreal. You can check out our YouTube channel. The link will be in the description down below. And you can also, well, I'll ask her where you guys can contact her online as well. Montreal, where can people find you online or, you know, how can they reach out to you? Yes, yes. All you got to do is go to, if you're interested in the testimony, just go to myescapefromsodom.com. And you can hit me right from the site. My information is there and reach out. And hey, I, it's all love. It's all love. I'm looking forward to connecting with people. All right. So guys, there you have it. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a big thumbs up. And remember to share this video with as many people as you possibly can, right? If it convicts your heart and you think it might help someone. Thanks for watching. Until next time. Bye for now. My name is Montria. And... For 22 years, I lived a homosexual lifestyle, period. I lived it so long that I wanted to be the opposite gender. I wanted to be a man. This is what I wanted to be. This is what I desired to be in my life. And if you would have told me 22 years ago that I would leave the lesbian lifestyle and give up you know, the possibility of being a transsexual to follow Christ, I would have never believed you. Never, ever, because in my mind, it was not possible for me. I had read about the Bible and I had read about things in the Bible. But I did not think that anything that happened in terms of that magnitude would ever impact me. I was who I was. I was the man. You know, people always say, was I a man? No, honey, I was the man. If it happened to me. It can happen to anybody <laughs> because I was not a candidate. Not only did it happen to me, it is the best thing that happened to me. Hands down, who I am now, I love. And who I am now can love anybody because he's in me. And it's such a beautiful thing. And whether you agree or not, at the end of the day, I love you. I love you. You can hit me up at any time. From a, from a place of respect. And we can always chat it up and chop it up. It's no problem. We might be different, but we all have the opportunity. We're not all God's children. People are oh, all God's children. That's a lie. We all have the opportunity to be a child of God. And so if it's something that you're thinking about, we don't have a lot of time. You know, people think, oh, I'm going to live to be, maybe, maybe you do and maybe you don't. But I guarantee you this, you only have a small segment in your eternal life to have that dialogue with Christ and to use that advantage to get into his kingdom. And I'm just inviting you to take that, to take the opportunity, take the opportunity. You ain't got to have all the answers. You know, oh, I've been living as a woman for 25 years. OK, you don't know how to live like no man. I understand. Oh, I've been living like a boy, but I get all that. I went through all that. You don't have to have all the answers. All you have to do is have the trust and the faith today to take the first step. If you don't want to take the first step, don't. <laughs> I ain't going to lose no sleep. But there's somebody watching this that they're going to put their foot out the first step. Just take the first step. Let Christ do the rest and you will be amazed. He will do exceedingly above anything you could ever imagine or dream of. That's it.